You are listening to the podcast of New Life Church in Wayland, Michigan. Our longing is to see zero people in our community living unchanged by Jesus. We are a church navigating the messiness of life together in community. One of our core convictions is that everyone is welcome, no one is perfect, and anything is possible. I hope you know there is a place in the family for you here. For more information on gathering times and location, check out our website. But for now, I hope God speaks powerfully to you through this word. Good morning, church. How are we doing this morning? Anybody else excited to worship together this morning, to be here together? Yeah, amen. We sent our uh, three young kids away to my parents for a night this weekend, and when you're a parent of three young kids and you do that, all you want to do when they're gone is nap. And so I took like 16 hours worth of naps this weekend, and it was amazing. Uh, So we're in uh, week three of our series, Christmas Scandals. And uh, this is the second to last week. The final part of the series will be coming up at our Christmas Eve services on Friday. Uh, But this series has really looked at the scandals of Jesus' family story. Matthew 1, the very, very first page of the New Testament, is a genealogy of Jesus. And when we don't really know what's behind that genealogy, it's the type of thing with a bunch of names we can't pronounce that we just like to skip over and assume is unimportant. But Jesus' genealogy has a lot of scandal, a lot of hidden gems in it, and we've been looking at some of those stories during the series, and and today is obviously going to be no exception to that. Now, did you know, when it comes to the Christmas story, there are a lot of assumptions that we actually make about the Mary and Joseph Christmas story. Like, for example, there is never a donkey mentioned that Mary rides in the story. And yet we assume that Mary rode to Bethlehem on a donkey, don't we? Another example here, and that's a reasonable assumption. It's not necessarily a bad one. Another one is there is no innkeeper in the story. We always assume there is an innkeeper in the story, but all the text tells us is there was no room for them in the inn. We don't know if there was an actual innkeeper. It could have just been a sign on the front door. Here's another one. We don't actually know that Jesus was born in a stable. What we know is he was wrapped in swaddling cloths and laid in a manger, but a manger in that day could have been a whole host of places. It doesn't actually tell us that it was a stable that he was born in. Here's another one. We don't know that there were three wise men. We know there was a group of magi that came to worship Jesus and they brought three gifts, but the text never says there were actually three wise men. I'm like blowing people's whole childhoods up right now. <laughs> this, this Christmas, I saw this picture for the first time, a kind of modern day depiction of Mary and Joseph. And if you can see that, like I love that picture Because for me, when I see that, it it messes with a lot of the assumptions that I make about the Christmas story, about how God moves and in whose lives he moves in. And I want to just ask this question this morning. We make make assumptions all the time, don't we? Like, we make assumptions in life all the time. People say, I make way too many assumptions. Well, they don't say that, but I I think they're thinking that all the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Maybe there's gaps in a story that you've heard, and you fill in those gaps with what? Assumptions. And that informs your entire perspective on people or on a story. Maybe for you, someone did something by accident to hurt you, and you make assumptions about their motives. You assume ill intent. Or this one's particularly prevalent around the holidays. Maybe you assume that the way it's always been is the way it's always going to be, that in your family story, there are rhythms and there are habits that are just unhealthy and painful to deal with around this time of year. And you make assumptions that the way it's always been is the way that it's always going to be. And the question, and I think this is a really honest and important question for us to ask this morning, is are your assumptions getting in the way of God moving in your life? Are your assumptions getting in the way of God moving in your life, because some assumptions are reasonable and helpful, like Mary riding on a donkey. That's not an unreasonable assumption. But other assumptions we make about God are not as helpful. Like, for example, my weaknesses get in the way of God using me. That's a really unhealthy, unhelpful assumption about how God moves. Or what about this one? Other people at church have just something I don't have. 
Other people have something I don't have. Or here's another one. You are disqualified from participating because you don't know as much about the Bible as the person next to you. Or here's the last one. God could never reach that person or salvage that relationship. You see, when it comes to God's movement in the world, we can make assumptions all the time about what it's supposed to look like, who it's supposed to happen to, who is worthy of participating. And the Christmas story, the very birth of Jesus, flies in the face of all of that. His family story flies in the face of all of that. Because Jesus was not the king that Israel was expecting. See, Israel was expecting a military leader who would overthrow all of their oppressors and restore her to her former glory once again. And yet Jesus comes as a peasant rabbi born into a displaced family lacking resources and lodging. His birth was a total surprise. And you want to know the way that God undoes or moves through our assumptions? It's through surprise. It's through the plot twist. It's when God shows up in unexpected ways through unexpected people and does unexpected things that he actually can awaken us to the work that he is doing in the world and more importantly, invite us to be participants in that. Are your assumptions getting in the way of God moving in your life? Because the two stories that we're going to look at today from the book of Matthew are perhaps two of the biggest plot twists, two of the biggest surprises in Jesus' genealogy, and I love that they're included, and we're going to look at why. So if you have your your Bible with you this morning, we're going to be, uh, like we have been the series, Matthew 1, and I'm just going to read two verses here from Matthew 1. So the first one is this, Matthew 1, verse 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. That's the very first verse in the New Testament. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Skipping down a few verses, a few generations, and this is what it says. And Salmon, or Salmon, however you prefer it, the father of Boaz by who? Rahab. And Boaz, the father of Obed by who? Ruth. And Obed, the father of Jesse. So we've already said before that including women in a genealogy was a plot twist enough for a Jewish genealogy. But the fact that these two women are included was a major plot twist for the hearers of this story. And I want to talk about why for a minute here. The first question I want to ask is, who is Rahab or who was Rahab? Who is she? Well, first of all, we know that Rahab is a Canaanite woman. She's a Canaanite. And if you know anything about the story or the history of Israel, Israel was in bondage in Egypt for 400 plus years. And God delivers them uh, through Moses' leadership. He delivers them out of Egypt. They cross the Red Sea. He does all of these miracles. And then the Israelites still can't get their act together. And so they wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And it's in this moment when Israel is about to cross over to take hold of a century and generations old promise that God had made to Abraham, just like verse 1 here, that God had made to Abraham. They're about to enter this promised land, and who is it that stands in the way of them taking hold of this promise? It's the Canaanites, one of the group of people standing in the way. The Canaanites, they are particularly evil and brutal, and mean, and ruthless group of people. And Rahab, in the story of Jesus, she is a Canaanite. Not only that, she's, she's a pagan. She's not a worshiper of God. She's not one of God's people. She is what we might call today an unbeliever. She is not a worshiper of Yahweh God. Who else is she? She's, she's a woman. We've talked a lot about how women in this day and age were excluded from the story so many times. In fact, in a Jewish court of law, women were not even trusted to testify under oath. They weren't considered credible sources in a court of law. So she's a woman. That's, that's a plot twist in the story. And then maybe perhaps the, the biggest one of all, she is also a sex worker. She's a prostitute. And I don't need to define that for you. If you want to know what that is, Josh Anderson would love, he would love to explain that to you. He would love it. Where is Josh? There he is. Hey, when I was a youth pastor, that was always my role too. People always throw me under the bus. So I got to, yeah. Anyways, so that's Rahab. 
a plot twist type character in God's story. And then the second character listed in this verse is Ruth. Who is Ruth? Well, Ruth, probably one of my favorite characters in the Bible, Ruth is a Moabite. And if you know anything about Moabites, they were not friends of the Jewish people either. In fact, they were descendants of Lot's incestual relationship with his daughter. Like Moab is the name of Lot's son that he had with his daughter. In fact, the very name Moab, there's kind of a Hebrew joke because it's very similar to the Hebrew word meaning from my father. And so Jewish people would have kind of this running joke about Moabites, that they were a people born from incest. Like, like in the show, Jerry Springer or Maury, like Lot, when it comes to Moab, you are the father and the grandfather. And this is really weird. And God, listen to this. This is how crazy like just the Moabite story is that these people were banned from even entering the assembly of God for 10 generations because of this sin between Lot and his daughter. This group of people was hated by Jew and Gentile alike. And to make it even worse, tradition tells us that Ruth is the daughter of the king of Moab. The, the text doesn't tell us this. This is a reasonable assumption about the text. But Jewish tradition tells us that she is the king of a guy named Eglon, who is one of the worst oppressors of Israel. One of the worst oppressors of God's people. And this woman, this Moabite, is listed in the story, the family story of Jesus. Not only is she a Moabite, but just like Rahab, she's, she's a pagan. She doesn't convert to Judaism until after her husband dies. She's a woman, and she's also a widow. And last week we talked about the powerless state that widows find themselves in in this world. So it is a huge plot twist that these two women are included in this story, but that's not the plot twist alone, because last week we talked about Tamar and Bathsheba, and even their presence in the story of Jesus is a plot twist. What is it about these two women that makes them such a big plot twist in God's story? Well, it's because Rahab and Ruth are absolute heroes in their respective stories. They're not just victims. They're not just people who have had injustice done to them. They are listed as absolute heroes in God's story. God makes outsiders heroes in his story. Plot twist. Are your assumptions about God getting in the way of how and where and in whose lives he wants to use you? You know, I love the story of Rahab because Rahab lives in Jericho. And Jericho, if you know anything about the story of Israel, it was kind of the center of Canaanite culture, a very influential and important city. And Jericho was a city that Israel needed to overtake if they were going to have any hope of securing the promised land. And so Joshua, who was the leader of Israel at the time, sends in two spies to go scope out the lay of the land in Jericho. And these two spies find shelter in Rahab's house. Now, there's two reasons why this was very strategic for these spies to go to Rahab's house. Number one, her house was located on the outside of the city wall. So it was on the very outskirts of the city. It had an easy access point through her window. And then the second one is being a lady of the night, it was not super uncommon for her to have men who had disguised themselves and hidden their identity coming in and out of her house regularly. So this made sense for these spies. It's the perfect setup for these spies to go scope out the lay of the land in Jericho. The only problem is Rahab's either a really bad prostitute or they're really bad spies because they get caught in the process. And so the king of Jericho confronts Rahab and he's like, where are these spies? Where are these spies? And she diverts the king's attention to another direction while she hides the spies on her roof, hiding in the straw up on her roof. And I want you to watch what happens in Joshua 2 here while they're up on her roof hiding out. Joshua chapter 2, verse 8. Before the men lay down, Rahab came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us. And that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan. To Shihon and Og. I have no idea if that's how you pronounce those names. Whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted. 
And there was no spirit left in any man because of you. So, and in other words, we were shaking in our boots. We were terrified. For the Lord, your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. A Canaanite, pagan, woman, sex worker is a hero in the story of Jesus. Why? Here's what strikes me about Rahab's story. She barely had any knowledge about God. She knew God had a people, and they were defeating a lot of their enemies. She doesn't have the pedigree. She certainly doesn't have the morality. Faith for Rahab is the chance to meet God and the courage to leap into a faith that she hardly understands. See, we have a tendency to put strong faith in weak things, don't we? Just look at our political landscape right now. I mean, I'm amazed at how strong of a faith people put in such weak things and leaders and parties. Same thing is true with money. We do the same thing with money. Job, security, we put strong faith in weak things all the time. And what this can lead to is walls we build up in our lives. Assumptions we make about how God wants to move and where he wants to do it. And Rahab shows us that even a weak faith in a strong God, man, powerful things can happen when that happens. Weak faith in a strong God can break down barriers. You see, Hebrews 11 is the place where the heroes of the heroes of faith are listed in this story. Hebrews 11 is where the shining examples of God's people are listed. And you know who is found there among the likes of Abraham and Moses and Sarah and Enoch and so many others? You know who is in that story? Rahab the prostitute. And she is listed exactly that way. In fact, there's rare times in the Bible where she's not listed as Rahab the prostitute. Matthew 1 is one of the only places where Rahab the prostitute, those, like that phrasing is not together. And I don't think that's meant to shame Rahab. I think that's meant to show how glorious God is and how powerfully he moves through the plot twists in our life. And so if a Canaanite pagan female sex worker who had weak faith in a strong God can be a hero in the story of Jesus, how might God want to use you in his story? Seriously. Like we, we come into this place and we think we have to have our act together or have a certain pedigree or even like clean ourselves up. And like Rahab confronts all of that. That, that even weak faith in a strong God without all of the knowledge or the morality or even the pedigree, God can use that. He can start in that place and he can move powerfully. Like, like do you bear the weight of a dark and shameful past that just paralyzes you all the time? Do you carry that with you still? Do your former sins taunt you with the lie that you are unworthy to inherit the kingdom of God? Are you hesitant to be used by God because you don't have all the knowledge of the person next to you? You know, some of us, some of us, have people in our lives who absolutely need to be at our Christmas Eve services this Friday. People living in darkness, people far from God, and those people will not be invited because we make assumptions about how God wants to move in other people's lives. The story of Rahab teaches us that God is the God of plot twist. And the kicker of Rahab's story, and the reason that she is listed as a hero of the faith, is because she was willing to participate in that. She's not, just a, she's not just a passive bystander. She's an active participant in the plot twist that God wanted to bring about in his people's story, in the world's story. And so that's Rahab. Now, maybe, maybe the assumptions you make about God are a little different. Maybe you assume that God is cold, that he's distant, that he's silent, that he's uninterested because you walked through some serious serious junk in your life. That exact thing happens in the story of Ruth. That Ruth's mother-in-law, her name is Naomi. And Naomi is a woman who has lost absolutely everything. She loses her home to a famine and has to move to Moab. Naomi's a Jewish woman moving from Bethlehem to Moab. She moves to Moab, where she's living in enemy territory. 
And not only that, but her two sons, they take wives from Moab. They take wives, Moabite wives, as Jewish men, very dishonorable. And not only that, but while living in Moab, she, her husband dies. She loses her husband. She becomes a widow. And if that's not bad enough, she's lost her home. Her sons have married uh, people that she probably wouldn't, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Approve, approve, hard words this morning, that she wouldn't approve of. She loses her husband, and then to make matters worse, both of her sons die as well. And so here's Naomi in a place where she has lost everything, where she is powerless, and God feels distant, and he feels silent, and she is bitter towards him to the point where she says these words about him. She says this, Naomi said to them, do not call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full. And the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? Who does God use to transform this woman's life? This woman who is bitter, who has lost so much. Like, who is it that transforms her life? Does anybody know? It's Ruth. Ruth is the one God uses to transform Naomi's life. Ruth, the Moabite, pagan, now Jewish, she converts, uh, woman, widow. She, he uses Ruth to transform Naomi's life. And what's so crazy about the story of Ruth is that God is not actually mentioned doing anything directly in the story of Ruth. There's no direct action of God. What we believe happens is that God actually moves through the characters of the story of Ruth, that he moves through Ruth, and that Ruth shows us how important the character of God is in this world, that she is an embodiment of the loving kindness and steadfastness character of God. See, Ruth, Ruth could have ditched Naomi multiple times, returned to Moab, Ruth had every chance throughout her story to take shortcuts that would kind of prop herself up and allow her to step forward, and yet she doesn't take those opportunities out of loving kindness for Naomi. At great risk to herself, Ruth embodies the character of God to a woman who has lost absolutely everything. Are your assumptions about God and who he uses and where he wants to move, getting in the way of him actually moving in your life. You see, at the end of Ruth's story, she is described as embodying the very character of God's redeeming love towards Naomi. These, these words weren't, aren't going to be on the screen, but I just I want to read them to you uh, from the book of Ruth here for a second. This is what happens at the end of Ruth's story when it comes to Naomi. In Ruth 4, verse 14, this is what it says. Then the woman said to Naomi, after all of the story plays out, they say, Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law, Ruth, who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Wow. God uses outsiders in his story to draw people to himself, to reveal his character to the world. God is the God of plot twists. Are your assumptions getting in the way of how God wants to move? Because this story is filled with all kinds of different people wrapped up in it. It's not just Jewish men. It's women as well. And it's not just Jewish people. It's Gentiles as well. And it's not just Jews and Gentiles who have their acts together, who are particularly moral and well put together. It's all different kinds of messed up, broken people that God invites into his story and actually uses powerfully to share his love with the world. Amen. Rahab and Ruth are absolute heroes in their respective story. And if God can make Rahab and Ruth into heroes in his story. Why do we still make assumptions about why and where and how and in whose lives he's going to do his most powerful redeeming work? See, as a pastor, I think sometimes I'm the quickest to make assumptions about how and where and in whose lives God wants to move the most. See, many of you have assumptions about pastors that we are somehow superstar Christians. 
And my role is to break that assumption down every single week up in front of you. That we don't deal with doubt and cynicism from time to time. And one of the things that I've noticed, for me personally, this is me and maybe you can relate, that the more quick I am to make assumptions about people, the more quick I am to make assumptions about where God will move, the quicker I am to become more cynical towards people. Like if I try to begin to predict exactly where God's going to move and in whose lives he wants to move, I find my level of cynicism towards people rising. Like God won't heal that marriage. Nope, not that one. God won't free that person from their addiction. Or that person is too angry or that person is too far gone. And what I've learned is that my cynicism isn't actually cynicism towards people. It's cynicism towards God and where he wants to move and what he wants to do. It's me assuming that I know where and how and in whose lives that he will move powerfully. But here's what I know is true, that I want my life to be bent towards redemption for people. I want our life as a church to be bent towards redemption for people. Like, I'm okay if that makes us look foolish from time to time or we get taken advantage of once in a while as a church. Somebody came up to me the other day and they said, did you know there's people who shop in our essential store that don't actually need it? And I said, yes, I'm well aware of that. And guess what? I'm okay with that. Because if somebody comes in and takes a dollar bottle of shampoo and they get prayed over, holy cow, that's well worth it. I'm willing to embrace that kind of plot twist. See, I want the life of our church to be bent towards redemption for people in our community. This statement, I think, is one worth writing down, or at least one worth taking a picture of. If Rahab shows us that the promises of God can be trusted, that he carried his people out of Egypt, that he carried them through all of these different things that he promised he would, if Rahab shows us the promises of God can be trusted, Ruth shows us that the character of God can be trusted, that the loving kindness, the steadfast love, the, the kindness of God can be trusted. And the reason that they are both heroes in their stories is because they were willing to participate in God's redeeming plot twists in their world. Are you? Are you willing to participate? Are you willing to open yourself up to where God wants to move and in whose lives he wants to move? Because here's what I know is true. There is not a single story of salvation on the planet where God did not move outside the box in some way. There is not a single death to life story where God brought somebody who was dead to their sins and makes them alive in Christ, where God did not introduce some kind of plot twist along the way. I don't care if you're five years old or 50 years old. God is the God of plot twist. That is the very message of salvation, that we were dead in our sins, and because of the plot twist of Jesus Christ, we can be made alive in him and used miraculously for his purposes. Amen. I've seen this as a pastor, guys, over and over. Like every Christmas, I, I tend to reflect on the year gone by. I tend to reflect on the years gone by, and I just, I wrote some things down that I've just, I've had the opportunity to see over the course of my life as a pastor, and every single one of these are plot twists. Every single one of these are ones that I would not expect, but God stepped in and did the miraculous, the improbable. Here's the first one. He doesn't know I'm sharing this, so I apologize, but celebrating the baptism of Tyler four months after trying to take his own life getting up in these waters and saying, God has redeemed me. He is the one who carries me. That is a plot twist that cannot be explained other than the power of God at work. Amen. Another one. I baptized my five-year-old daughter on Easter this year, this past year. And, and I got to tell you, when she first came up to me and said she wanted to get baptized, my very first response is, you're, like in my head, I didn't say this out loud, but my very first thought was, you're five, you're too young and yet this little girl is continuing to grow in her faith and teach me things about Jesus that I need to see through her eyes. That is a plot twist of God using somebody in my life that would not be expected. Here's another one. Several years ago, I had the opportunity to lead a group of students to Never the Same Camp, and, and our group had a group of deaf students with us. And so there was a, a woman there interpreting. She, she is deaf herself. 
And I had the opportunity over the course of the week to have many conversations with her about God, about Jesus, about his love for her. And she described herself, this is her description, not mine, as a deaf, bitter, gay woman. And at the end of the week, she put her trust in Jesus. And I got to baptize her a couple months after that. Talk about having no knowledge. Like, I felt completely unequipped in that situation. That was the Holy Spirit working. I didn't have the answers. I didn't know the culture of the deaf community. God just moved. And I just wanted to be a participant in that. I didn't want to get in his way. Here's another one. Several years ago, during the summer, I had the opportunity to prayer walk in downtown Grand Rapids with a group of students. And we were on the west side, Bridge Street area, if you know Grand Rapids. And we were stopping in front of different places as students felt led to pray. And one of the students in our group, she said, I need to stop in front of this house and pray over this house because this is the house where for my entire childhood, my uncle sexually abused me every single day. And I want to pray over this house. I want to pray for healing over this house. I want to pray for the family that lives in this house. God is the God of plot twists. Here's another one. I lost one of my really close friends, Carolyn, a few years ago on Christmas Eve. I mean, this powerhouse woman of God, she, uh, man, I just love Carolyn. She was uh, a singer, had the raspiest smoker's voice. She, she led karaoke at a local dive bar near our church up in Grand Rapids when we were there. Carolyn was just a force to be reckoned with. Oh, man, I'm in, and she passed away on Christmas Eve. And uh, I was able to preach the gospel at her funeral. And there were hundreds of bikers and bartenders and like people that this doesn't exactly feel fit to reach. And dozens of them responded to Christ because God is the God of the plot twist. Uh, praying with Sandy Ruckus on the phone a few weeks ago, the day she thought she was going to pass away from COVID. her husband back there right now. Oh, I'm sorry. God is the God of the plot twist. I didn't know a year ago that we were going to open an essential store this year. I didn't even know we were going to renovate that space this year. God did. And there are people in your life People in this community, I have such a burden for reaching this community for Jesus. And there are people in your life that you have written off, that you have said are too far gone. But the same is true for me. There are people in my life who I've written off, who, who I've said are too far gone. And God is inviting us to participate in the plot twist that he wants to bring out about in this world. I want to participate with God as much as possible in that. I want to have, even if it's a weak faith, I want to have a faith in a strong God who is able to do the improbable through weak faith. And so where does the rubber hit the road for you in this? Maybe for you it begins with just making more room in your heart for God to do the unexpected that you walk through this life trying to control and white-knuckle grip everything that he wants to do, and he wants to actually do a new thing in your life. Isaiah 43 says, don't dwell on the old thing because God wants to do a new thing. Maybe that's it for you. Maybe for you, there is a calling that you know God has put on your life, and you haven't stepped into that because you're, you're afraid, it's unknown, it feels unsafe, and God is calling you, pursue this calling. Maybe it's working with students here in our church or discipling kids in our church or serving in the essential store. Maybe it has nothing to do with what's happening in these four walls. Maybe it's somebody God is calling you to reach in your workplace. Maybe, maybe for you, it's handing out an invite card. There's invite cards on your chairs and not just handing them out generally to as many people as possible, although that's a good thing, but maybe there is a specific name on your mind that you have believed for far too long is too far gone. I want God to do a plot twist in that person's life. Will you participate? Let me pray, and then we're going to respond in worship.
God, this morning I'm just, uh, I'm just reminded of how unexpectedly you move. <laughs> Eight months after even getting to this church, a global pandemic landed, and one of the biggest plot twists of most of our lives happened. And God, I believe you, you can use that. You do use that. But the church we are today does not look anything like what I thought it would. And it's beautiful. And you're doing stuff. And I want to be a participant in that. I want the people in this room, I want the people watching online to be a participant in that. To not just have this be kind of one added thing to their week that they have to do, but to actually belonging to a community of faith like this empowers us and equips us to go out and to participate in the unexpected things that you want to do in this world. And so, God, may we have a faith that is okay getting taken advantage of from time to time. May we have a faith that is okay looking foolish from time to time, God. God, may we have stories as a result of that kind of faith that can only be attributed to you and what you are doing in this world. God, we love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray and everybody said.